Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Incentives. Let's talk a little bit about incentives. Everybody knows what an incentive is. Incentives, uh, and we're all affected by them. Uh, even if we don't realize that we're affected by incentives, we are. That's why that you can sometimes uh, uh, open up a cabinet and find 16 of the same thing when you only need one. But you got 16 because man, there were some incentives about getting those other 15. So that's incentive. And we like them, you know, coupons are incentives. I'm a coupon clipper. I would admit it. I'm a coupon clipper. And I remember that when the kids were at home, and we had all of our kids at home, uh, uh, by the way, we're still supporting them, they just live somewhere else. But uh, when we had, all, we had all of our kids at home, okay, we, we of course clipped coupons for all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, and uh, so one time I said, well, you know, are we really even, are we really saving anything with this? And I once just figured it out, just sketchy. And, and in one year, we saved $4,000 by just clipping coupons. Can you imagine? Instead of buying retail. You know? And of course, there's BOGOs. We all love BOGOs. But that's not a clown. That's buy one, get one. Okay? BOGO the clown. No. It's buy one, get one. And, and uh, that is an incentive to people. That's, that's really an incentive to people. And the, uh, the um, people who manufacture stuff, they know that. They know that. So they'll put a can up there. Uh, let's say of uh, uh, beans, and they'll say, uh, you know, 60 cents, 60 cents for that can of beans. And uh, buy one, get one free. Buy one, get one free. So 30 cents, not bad. While across the aisle, another brand of those same beans are 25 cents a can. <laughs> but hey, I got one free. Uh, yeah, an early tea at the golf course. You know, that's an incentive. Would you like to have an early tea at the golf course? Well, we have to get all our work done Friday. You know, I get that early. I get there for that early tea, or book a cruise. If you book this cruise today, you get two extra days free. Two extra days free. So, all kinds of things, incentives, and incentives call people to do all kinds of amazing things. Sometimes for good, and sometimes for bad. For instance, let's take cheating. Cheating is actually an incentive. Examples of that would be, uh, which is a popular one. Some author once said it's really the primordial economic act. Cheating is the primordial economic act. It's getting more for less, however way you can do that, right? And people risk a lot. They risk a lot sometimes in order to feel as though they're getting more uh, for less. And they may cheat to do it. Take the example of the sudden disappearance of 7 million children uh, in the United States of America on April 15th in uh, 18, uh, 1987. Uh, how many of you heard about that on CNN? How many of you heard and read about 17 million children? Not, I mean, I'm sorry, not 17, 7. 7 million children just suddenly didn't exist. They weren't there. It wasn't alien abduction either. They just weren't there anymore. What happened? Well, on April 15th of 1987, up until that time, up until that time, when you declared dependent children on your taxes, you only had to put their name. From 1987 on, you had to put their social security number. Suddenly, on one tax day, seven million dependent children just disappeared. Cheating. So the incentive now to cheat on your taxes by claiming I've got all these dependent children wasn't there anymore, was it? Was it? And they thought it was maybe a little bit better to, you know, not claim them anymore. It was a massive abduction. No, it wasn't. It was simply people cheating on their taxes. Incentives caused uh, uh, salesmen to work harder. Uh, or they can cause them to fudge on the numbers uh, so that they look good. This actually happened to a friend of mine who was in the casualty insurance business. Okay, He looked great, won all kinds of prizes, incentives, got all kinds of bonuses for writing all kinds of, of insurance policies. Right Until one day a man walked in uh, and wanted to make a claim on a policy that he had written with this guy, and no such policy existed. No such policy existed. So he looked awfully good on paper, but in fact, his incentives of doing that were wrong. Incentives can make top athletes do things that they shouldn't do. Uh, they, uh, in order to fatten their wallets, for instance, using illegal performance-enhancing drugs uh, to win championships, 
Uh, incentives can determine how a, a real estate agent may list your property uh, for their advantage, maybe not necessarily for your advantage. So these are incentives. Bottom line is incentives are the glue that really runs the whole world's economy. Uh, and we want to, the best for ourselves, obviously. And we, we want the best without necessarily having to pay the most. And, and you do have to shop for bargains, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we don't want to pay too much for something. And nothing makes you feel any worse than having bought something that you really needed and you really shopped around for. It. And the day you bought it, uh, two days later, the same thing is on 10% 10, 10 less. This kind of thing happens all the time. However, we're going to look today into 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And if you have your Bibles, you can open them up there to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to be encouraged to ponder on something very important, some questions. And they're related to a divine and sanctified incentive for giving to the work of the kingdom of God. These are sanctified. These are the divine incentives that the Lord has put upon us that we might be His people in the given place in the vineyard where He's placed us in order that we do for the kingdom according and proportionally to what He has given us in blessing and grace. So the first question we want to ask is, what is our number one incentive, our ideal example of Christian giving? What would that be? So we can understand in the material world what uh, qualifies as incentives for things we want. But what about the kingdom of God? What kind of incentives are we going to look at there? Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to read from verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll read from verse 6. And so Paul is writing there. He says the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, uh, sometimes we just read over that and we think that is kind of like a, it's kind of like a euphemism. You know, everybody loves a cheerful giver. Uh, but when it says God loves a cheerful giver, it has some little bit of punch to it. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. It says in verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times... Now, any time that in, in writing, uh, in Hebrew or in this uh, Koine Greek in the Scriptures... You say something three times is very important. So he says, all, all, all. You're all sufficient, all things at all times. You may abound, why? In every good work. So why did God bless you? Well, he blessed you the same reason he blessed Abraham. So I'm blessing you to be a blessing to the nations. Everyone who blesses you will be blessed. And so he says to his church and he says to us that he's blessed us to be a blessing. He's blessed us to be a blessing. So if we have extra toys we're not using, we're to share them. Right? We have things that we cannot, don't need to do. We find a way to share them. And we do. That's what we do in our society. I think the United States of America is, in, in a sense, and it has been for, for a long time, uh, a country uh, that is remarkable for its giving. Okay? And that's part of the Christian principles on which it was founded. And so he goes in verse 9 and says, As it is written, He, who, he, uh, he has distributed freely, He has given to the poor... His righteousness endures forever. God is righteous. He has given us everything. And all He's asking is for us to now be able to recognize in the kingdom how we share that. And He says in verse 10, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply uh, uh, and multiply your seed of sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So now He's taking this kind of physical idea of sowing plentifully in the fields of the world in order to return, get a return, he now takes that example and uses it in the spiritual world. How are we in the spiritual world being motivated by the Holy Spirit and by our commitment to Christ also sow uh, in, in, in grace and peace and, and, and the love of God uh, the good things of the Lord into the world uh, so that we have all sufficiency and grace, etc.? You will be enriched in every way. 
The word for every way there is to, to mean both spiritually and physically. To be generous in every way. So you're going to be blessed in every way to be generous in every way. That's why every time that we, we step out, we give uh, to whatever the cause is, we give it in the name of Christ. It's why we're doing it. It's interesting that uh, there was a huge relief organization. I believe it was Samaritan's Purse. I'm not uh, quite sure, but I think it was Samaritan's Purse. And they had all of this food. They had all of this food uh, and they had, uh, that they were sending to uh, uh, a Civil War ravished country. And uh, the, the ship docks and they bring the food in and all the relief workers at the dock, they, they take all the food off and it says right on there, uh, Ministry of Samaritan First and talks to the little Christian witness. All this is on the boxes, it's very clear. And so they haul it all on trucks. They don't get five miles from the docks until the rebels attack them, right? The rebels attack the convoy. They take all the food, destroy all the boxes, then they distribute the food to the people saying it came from them. See? Now, one would say then a relief group might say, well, we're not going to do relief there anymore because obviously we're not getting credit. No. They just sent another ship. They saw it too. They got guarded better. No. We don't stop because the world's against us. We give, Paul says, generously in every way so that we might produce thanksgiving to God. Not to us. Not to us, but to God who has motivated it. I remember a doctor one time told me, an older doctor, she was in her, she was in her 70s. She said when she was a little girl in India, she, when she was a little girl in India, these doctors came from the United States. Okay, these doctors, and we're talking the 1940s. You know, uh, uh, pre-World War II. These doctors would come. They'd come from England, some from Europe, some from the United States. And they would come there to minister to them. And she, <laughs> and she couldn't believe it. Why are these people coming here to help us? Uh, why, why are they doing this? And, the, and so she asked one of these relief workers, one of these doctors. She said, why, why are you coming here? You know, look at you. I mean, you come from this wonderful place. And you're coming to this place of filth and... and, and Poverty, a place like this. I mean, she, she was using you know teenage words, but why do you do that? And the person just very plainly said, "Because you need it, and God has sent me here to give it to you." It's that simple. Because you need it, and God has sent me here to do it. That transformed that young girl's life to become a doctor, and herself is working today as a doctor in a missionary circumstance. It's just an amazing thing. This is what St. Paul says when it, it just grows and grows. The people who sow abundantly in the field of God's grace also reap abundantly in the fields of God's grace. So St. Paul turns uh, to, uh, to an image here that is rooted in the Old Testament as he gives this little section in uh, 2 Corinthians 9. This sharing with others is like sowing seed so that the more generous the seed goes out there, the, the more harvest one is able to, to, to reap it. And this is not a promise that if you send $7 to our ministry, you're going to get $77 back. <laughs> uh, though that's okay if you want to send $7 to my back. But uh, it doesn't mean you're going to get $77 back. You know, that's not what that means. What it means is God, as it says in James, our epistle text today, when you've asked for the right reason and for the right purpose, then God blesses so that God's glory may be raised up and God may receive the thanksgiving on the lips of those who have received from His goodness. So God is able to make all grace abound to you, He said in the text, so that in all things, at all times, in all places, you have total sufficiency in every good work. You've got everything you need to do the good work that God has sent you to do. God will never send you for a work that He will not provision you in that work. And when His provision stops in that work, and you've been honest about it, then that means that work is finished and you move on to the next work. Here's a little phrase. The conviction that God is able to supply our needs is the incentive that frees us to give generously without fear that we will deprive ourselves or our family by responding to meet the needs of others. It's that simple. That's our spiritual incentive. We have a God who is able and when we're incentivized by Him to just step out in the grace and the giving that He has asked, then things happen. Incredible things happen.
happen. In this uh, context, then St. Paul tells us some important stuff here. He says, each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or upon compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, what he's saying here is, there was clearly at the time of Paul, laws concerning giving. Simply, there were laws. Now, a lot of people understand the tithe, and that in the Jewish community there was tithe. Paul, uh, Jesus talked about how the Pharisees tithed even the the herbs in their garden. It was incredible. You know, they were just really keeping the tithe. What you don't understand is that was just the beginning of their giving. That was just the beginning of their giving. Right? Remember when Jesus talked about the Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray with the publican? You know, he talked about all that he did, all that he does, all that he gave away, all that he prayed, and all this kind of stuff. So not only did you just tithe, give the ten, but you gave over and above that. So it was not, it was not out uh, out of the ordinary for people at the time of Jesus to give 25-30% of what they made uh, in order to give to the poor. And what is the one parable, one parable that Jesus gave where he talks about a very you know, wealthy person and how he didn't do too good. It was the man who had a very good harvest one year. So this man went out, planted his fields, and he had this incredible bumper crop. I mean, this incredible harvest. He said, what am I going to do with all of this? He says, I know what I'll do. I'm going to build more barns. We call them silos. I'm going to build more barns. I'm going to put it all in there. I'll put it all in these barns. And then I'm going to have, then I'm going to relax. I'm going to retire. And, I was, and he says, and what does Jesus say in the parable? God says, this night will your soul be required of you. Then who's going to get all of this? Who's going to get all of this? This man lived in a community. He lived in a community where he was to share his wealth with his workers. He didn't sow that field by himself. He didn't reap that harvest by himself. That community did that. The people who worked for him, the extra people he had to hire. The whole community was supposed to prosper, not just him. God has prospered you that the whole community of faith may prosper. And that community of faith can be anywhere in the world, but that it would all prosper. Again, he is, he is careful not to place any, on any believers, Paul is careful not to place this obligation. Why? Why is he not going to place an obligation? No, you have to give this much. So, well, I remember one, uh, one evangelist once told me, he said, well, how many people are you going to get into your church? If you have a sign out there, and I'll use the name of, of this church, uh, if you have the a sign out there that said, Peace, Prince of Peace Church, right? Prince of Peace Church. You know, all you need to be a member of this church is give us 10% of everything you have. Uh, they'll be beating down the doors coming in here with me. <laughs> See, that's his point. He never wants to set that on them. Because there may be people out there who are incentivized to give 50%. There may be people out there incentivized to give 30%. There may be people to give way beyond the tithe in order that God's work be expanded into the world. And we're really, the, the, the day has come for us to be world Christians. There's a church in the metro area called World Changer Church. You like that? Every church is to be a world changer church. You know, we can put that at the bottom of our site, a oh, world changer church. I was driving down uh, US 29, a big, big billboard. Come to such and such church. Jesus is there every Sunday. I thought it was at my church every Sunday. How can you get that? So, you follow what I'm saying? We're, we're, we're to be incentivized by what we have in our heart, which is in proportion to how God is. If we never reflect on what God has given us, we think that we have everything we have because we've worked hard for it. Remember what uh, Moses says in Deuteronomy. He says, you know, when you get into the land, you folks... This is what Moses is saying to him. He's probably pointing his finger just like I am. When you get into the land, you folks, and all of a sudden you have all this prosperity and you're doing so good and everything you lay your hand to is just oh, prosperous. Don't think it's because of your talent or because of your hard work because it's God Himself that gives you the ability to do hard work. God always gets the glory. That's not just a New Testament concept. That was all the way back there in Deuteronomy. God is the one who always gives the glory. Second, next question. What is the outcome then of this kind of grace giving? What is the outcome of that? We'll, we'll go on in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, beginning at verse 12. For the ministry of this service, now notice what he, the word ministry there is stewardship or management. 
uh, uh, I'm sorry, is meant, the word ministry there, the word service is stewardship or management, uh, is not only supplying the needs of the saints, that is, it doesn't just supply the needs of the congregation, of the, of the congregation of the saints, those that are believers, but it also overflows into many thanksgivings to God by their, uh, by their approval of this service they will glorify God because of your submission uh, uh, flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ. He says, what you've done is you have accepted Jesus. You have confessed the faith. We will stand up in a moment and confess the creed. We will say, this is what we believe. This is how we believe this is what, who God is, who Jesus is, what the Holy Spirit has done, and we're going to confess that. Right? And he said, that is your confession of the gospel of Christ. And he says there's something that overflows from that. Overflows from that. It's the generosity of your contribution for them and for others. That is, for those in the faith and for others. So is the church just supposed to be concerned about the people in our community that are Christian? No, we're concerned about everyone in our community. Because we want everyone to come to know and, uh, the truth of Christ to be saved. And while they long for you and pray for you, now he's talking about those that that uh, need what they're going to give in Jerusalem, not only for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for His inexpressible gift. And the word gift there is associated with gift to the word grace. For God's inexpressible grace. When I say inexpressible, is nobody, none of us here really can define in a, so to speak, terminal way what God's grace is. How can we ever plumb the depths of it or know how deeply God loves us? Now, we can always point to the cross and say he loved us enough to give his only son. And we can understand that, you know, this person went to death and bled for us. And we understand those things. But how do we, can we really plumb the depths of God's love for us? And what Paul says, when you participate in this way, you're acting like God in people's lives. It's funny, isn't it? When you can supply something to someone that actually gives them life, actually gives them life. So we have our mission hospital in India, and, and we, uh, 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 drugs are supplied there, surgeries, people can come there. How do we measure, how can we measure our giving to that, how can we measure our commitment to that, to the lives that are saved? How do you measure that? You can't. Because none of us can know what the future of that one that is saved will be. Just as that teenage girl who was so impressed with these missionaries that were coming and these doctors, they had no idea when they spoke to her she would become one day a missionary doctor. They had no way of knowing that. They simply had the goodness of the Lord overflowing in them out to others who at the time may not have been Christian. Here's what St. Paul says in a nutshell here. It supplies the needs of God's people. This kind of generosity that flows from the incentive of grace supplies the needs of God's people, but it overflows in expressions of thanks to God and stimulates praise. Stimulates praise. I'm going to give you one, one simple example. You know, I take a lot of my examples, of course, from India because that's my, my most you know, uh, intense kind of missionary experience. So uh, I was asked to speak at a conference, uh, and a uh, um, Mission India conference, 1,400 children. So these 1,400 children were coming for a children's Bible camp, one-day children's Bible camp, and they asked me to speak to these children. Well, and uh, as it turned out, I got there a little late. About half of them had to go home because they were going in uh, on bicycles and stuff like that, and they had to get home before dark. And so I had about maybe 400, 500 kids left there by the time I got there. Uh, and I, I was speaking to their, the Sunday school teachers or to the teachers that teach the kids. And finally, I was going to uh, speak to these children uh, in, in, this, in this Bible camp. And so I, I speak with the children in the Bible camp. We have this little session. We have these songs. We do all this. We hand out gifts to kids that, you know, showed themselves particularly uh, uh, impressive during the Bible camp and that sort of thing. A story came back to me later. There was a, there was a, there was a child... Uh, who having, having gone to a Mission India Bible camp, had uh, gone back to her village. It turns and She had accepted Christ. She was like 10 years old, 10 or 12 years old. She had accepted Christ. And um, so she went back to her village, 
And when she went back to her village, she was really on fire for Jesus. And her grandmother, her grandmother uh, lived with her. And her grandmother was all bent over. Her grandmother could not stand up. Okay. Why was her grandmother bent over? Because, supposedly, this is what everybody in the village believed, she was bent over because she did something that the uh, village shaman didn't like, and he cursed her. He was a Hindu, and he put a curse on her. Okay, And ever since he put the curse on her, she couldn't stand up straight. So uh, she had to be taken care of. She couldn't work anymore. So her uh, granddaughter comes and visits her grandmother, and she told her all about Jesus. That she had learned about Jesus, the Bible camp, you know, children's Bible camp. Told her all about it. And, and so she, the grandmother said, well, do you think this Jesus could, could help me? Sure, sure. Will you pray for me? So the little girl prays over her grandmother. Right? She stands straight up. And so she stands straight up walking around the village telling everybody it was Jesus that did it. Well, the shaman was very upset. So he starts uh, throwing a bunch of more curses at her. Nothing seems to stick anymore. And pretty soon the village is starting to open up to Jesus. Just one little kid from one little Bible camp in the middle of nowhere, right? So we never know, see, when we're incentivized by grace to go out and move in these areas, we never know what's going to happen. And secondly, he says, it demonstrates our obedience. So when we're incentivized by grace, it de demonstrates our obedience, which means our commitment and our role within the kingdom. You're being obedient to what God has done. Everyone is gifted by the Spirit to use their gift in the kingdom of God for the sake of the vineyard of Christ. And when we do that, then we're obedient, then things begin to happen. And, and that's all God has asked you to do. Share. Share the gospel. Be obedient. Things happen. You will never know till you're in heaven what the ripple effect of one little gospel stone you dropped in the sea of humanity, you will never know how far that ripple went and what it did until you see the Lord. And that's why we do it. We're simply obeying it. He said go. He said tell. He said baptize. We're just going to go do that. We're going to go do that. You know, missionaries are obviously out. How many people did you baptize? Well, we baptized 16 people. And said, well, have you followed up on them? Well, they, they're, they're pretty remote. We, we've sent people to maybe look at them and we gave them a Bible. So we're just trusting God to do something with that. How many people do you think that John the Baptist actually sent his disciples to look after after they were baptized in the Jordan? We're just doing what God tells us to do and see where the Lord will lead. It doesn't mean we don't want to follow up on them. It just means we may not be able to. We're going to trust the Lord in that. And finally, it says, and we've said this before, it generates prayers for the giver by the one who receives the giving. We had Pastor Solomon here who came and explained to us in our sanctuary here what some of our uh, uh, giving from our uh, uh, learning center has done to help him in his ministry, uh, uh, not only in his evangelism to the very poorest people in the slums of Hyderabad, uh, but also the, the children there. And we, we just really see that, that the church is being set upon uh, in India uh, by uh, di different forces because it's really making some progress amongst the poorest, right? So what did he do while he was here? He prayed for us. We had a little healing service here. People got healed, right? So he prayed for us. Prayer overflows to those who are receiving from God the good things from those of us who are being obedient to his word. And so as St. Paul then has shown us earlier, it, it permits us to experience uh, the faithfulness of God who is able. And this, this loving, loving that we do in order to supply for genuine needs in people's lives. And see how God works in that. How God works in that. It's okay. It's okay to give to a ministry and then find out later from that ministry what's happening. Uh, and, and it's good to do that. You know, uh, I was visiting a small Dalit village. in Dalit are the poorest people in India. And I was uh, visiting the small village uh, that was on the banks of a huge reservoir near uh, the city of Nalore. And um, my uh, missionary companion and myself, as we entered this village, we were met by a whole group of people who sang us into the village. So they sang us into the village and immediately brought us to a house and offered us uh, uh, green coconut water. That's all they had to offer us, green coconut water. So I took my little glass of green coconut water and I drank it. 
<clears throat> my companion was not big on green coconut water. <laughs> so he took a sip and then I drank his. <laughs> but uh, that's all they had to offer. And then uh, showed us around things that they were doing, uh, uh, you know, the kind of stuff that they were into in this little village. Most of the people in that village make less than 75 cents a day. And so, um, uh, the equivalent of 75 cents a day. And so, uh, after we, before we leave though, the elder of that village, which happened to be a woman, the elder of that village invited us to her place, and her house was no bigger than this area right here, a thatched mud place, uh, because she wanted us to bless that place and pray for her. And then she wanted to bless and pray for us. See? And that's how it works. Uh, that's, that's, that's what goes on. So what are we then to imply from all of this? Well, in our earlier messages, you know, of course, St. Paul uh, had abandoned the, the typical incentives of motivation of the law to do things. And he, is, uh, he doesn't want us to be uh, a, a slave to the law. He did not want to try to produce some kind of guilt in us to do this or that to, into the church, especially in the lives of the Corinthians in this case, but by extension ourselves today. Uh, he wasn't going to manipulate anybody by giving these old sad stories and, you know, if you don't do this, people are going to drop dead in the street. He didn't do any of that stuff. Okay? He, he rather just said, this is what God has done for you. Look, this is where you were. You Corinthians, totally lost in your paganism. This is where Christ has put you. He has set you now on the mountain of salvation in the light of God. He has given you the Holy Spirit so that you don't lack any gift. And he says, all I'm asking of you is now look into your hearts and find out if that's not worth you giving God something back by helping the people that God also wants to be saved. Pretty simple message. Nothing complicated about it. Pretty simple. And that's all he's saying to these Corinthians. What he's saying to us. In short, his primary incentive is Christ Jesus who dwells in us by faith. That's the incentive. And so what kind of pattern might we see in our local context here? As we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 in our local context, what that might that look like? How, how would uh, uh, our approaches to the needs um, and our generosity and cha making changes in our local environment uh, be uh, an incentive that uh, uh, we are hoping in Christ for, for His glory? Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's who we are working for. Here are a few things you have in your outline there at the bottom of your outline. It would seem that these incentives would show these four kinds of elements. Number one, we would present needs. In other words, we as a, as a whole Christian church have needs presented to us. And those, when those needs are presented to us, do we not respond to those needs? We do respond to those needs. And that's to the glory of God. That we should respond to those needs. Real human needs get met. Practical things. Therefore, when someone stands up and says the PRC needs this, what do we do? We say, well, go to some other church. We ain't got time for that. No. We respond. We respond. If someone comes to us and, and they say, look, we need some clothing for homeless vets. You know, it's going to be wintertime pretty soon. And we've got a whole bunch of homeless vets out there without coats. What are we going to do about it? We respond. It's okay to bring needs. It's okay. And so the impoverished children in the Hyderabad slums is made known to us. And our learning center decides we're going to take our chapel offerings and give it to those kids. And even our very own widows in this congregation who need people out at their house, we go out to their house. Because we're going to give and support just as God has blessed us. Number two, we would uh, encourage each other to evaluate his or her own needs in view of the resources and against the needs of brothers and sisters elsewhere. So there are people beyond us beyond us, just as the millions of, of refugees uh, from war-torn Syria and Iraq. So, we, uh, and many of them Christian. Not all of them, but many of them Christian. And those that have survived the Christian Holocaust going on there. Okay? Uh, and, and remember, wealth is always comparative. You know, uh, some people can get by, by with little. I've known, uh, there are people who are just fine with, with, not just fine, but at least they're living and they're, they're doing fine. I've seen it in India. 
on about uh, what would the equivalent of six hundred dollars a year, six hundred dollars a year. So uh, I uh, woke up early one morning, and there was a the I'm, I'm in the town of Chirala, and there are squatters. So in the town of Chirala, like a lot of towns, uh, you have the houses all set back from the street. And so you have a, a, a distance of about from here to the back of the church, which is supposed to be just open space from the road. <laughs> no. It's squatters everywhere. Any little patch of ground they can put a shed or a hut, that's where they're going to live, right? And, so, and they work, and they work at whatever jobs, day labor, whatever they can, all right? And so I'm, I wake up early one morning. Uh, there's a little hobble out by the road. That morning, uh, the young mother who lives there with her husband and, and a couple of children uh, come out uh, of that. Uh, she goes to a well, which is a community well across the street, gets some water, comes back, and after a little while, I guess she warmed the water up or something, she comes back. She sits down on the ground in front of her hut. She takes the baby that she's going to bathe, puts the baby in her lap, and bathes that baby out of that glass, out of that water, right there on, right there on the street. Okay? So needs and wealth and so on is relative. She's doing fine. Right there, right? All right? She's, she's making do with what she has, what the blessings God has given her. And she's making good with that, right? Think about this for a moment. <laughs> How many of you have heard of the one percenters? One percent. Raise your hand if you're a one percenter. Oh, you're a one percenter? Oh, no, you're just saying you heard about it. Okay. Yeah. If you're a one percenter, raise your hand. I happen to be a one percenter. <laughs> now I'll tell you in what context I'm a one percenter. If your income is more than five dollars a day, if your income is, uh, other than Christian, uh, and some of the kids here, if your income is more than $5 a day, you are better off than 80% of the world. 80% of the world earns $5 or less a day. Remember what I said about the Dolly community? The people that are working there, they're not working, only get about 75 cents a day. Okay? If your annual income is $50,000, is $50, your annual income is 50 after everything, Social Security or whatever you may be getting or any kind of annuity or your job is over $50,000 a year. You are better off than 95% of the world. You're already a 5%er. You're already a 5%er. Now, for you 1%ers, if your income is $60,000 a year, you're better than 99% of the other people in the world. We're all 1%ers. Almost everyone in this room. Now, not all of you are 60,000 a year, I know. But most of us are 1% of the world. Of the world. So you see, it's relative, isn't it? You know? Do, do you have children in school? If you have children in school, then you're better off than 72 million children who never go to school. Never go to school. They make their, they make their uh, living by living in the garbage dumps of the metropolises of the world. Uh, the one outside Cairo, the one outside of Juarez, the one outside of um, uh, Brasilia, uh, of Arge uh, down in Argentina. All of those places, that's where they live. Okay? 72 million children. Do you have an indoor uh, uh, and uh, lavatory and toilet? Do you have an indoor? You're better off than 2.6 billion people with a B. Uh, do you turn uh, your lights on today? Did anybody turn the lights on? We turn them on in here. Scott did a nice job of turning down the air conditioning. And uh, so we, we, we're comfortable, right? Over half the world's population has no access to reliable source of electricity. At our mission hospital, we never know when electricity is going to go out. You never know when it's going to go out. Much of, the, uh, much, uh, uh, of our support there, not, a, not all of it, certainly, but a good portion of our support goes goes to maintaining our two generators, which have to run the whole place when there's no electricity. So, you know, we have very reliable electricity most of the time. And how, and how we squeal if it's out for an hour. <laughs> Over half the world's population has no access to that kind of energy source. And about 1.6 billion have no electricity at all. No electricity at all. So, you see, it's kind of relative at that point when we think about it that way. Number three, 
We would reject any manipulation under the law. If we're, if we're being incentivized by grace, we can't be moved by law. We would never think of, uh, of saying, well, I'm doing this because God, God commanded it. God commanded it. I'm doing this because I can never pay God back. I'm doing this because I'm, I'm incentivized by God who loved me enough to give me a son. Who loved me enough to give me His kingdom. Jesus said to His disciples, He says, Fear not, little children, it has pleased your Father to give you the kingdom. That's the God I'm serving. How can I ever outgive Him? So I'm never incentivized by law. Never at all. The incentive remains purely and only a practical response to the grace that has been given to me and you. The all-availing work of Jesus Christ who though He was rich made Himself poor that we might become rich in grace, right? And righteousness before God. And number four, we would teach freeing truths, that is, preach grace as the chief incentive. That's the truth that we want to get out there. That's the truth we want to go for. Grace is the greatest and best incentive that we need, brothers and sisters. The grace of God. And before we apply that incentive to the stewardship of the life of the church, we ought to, of course, be some applying it to our lives. If you've not applied that grace principle in your lives, it's going to be hard to, to place it in the church. We're all members of the same body, each of us having its own purpose in the body. And if we have been personally incentivized by grace, then the community is incentivized by grace in giving. And as we ask uh, 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 as we take to heart some of the things that St. Paul is teaching us here, we then, what, experience both the freedom and the release to serve. I'm free and released to serve, even now. We are free by our Christian lives from the compulsion of the law. And we are liberated to become blessings to others, just as Dr. Chikala and his wife, who is a physician, work in our mission hospital they came back to the United States this year to sell their house here so that they can support their mission there. It's that kind of thing. When you're incentivized by grace, you have decided, you make a decision in your life by God's work in you then to commit what, to what God has given you to do. And so through this kind of growing trust in God, the God, the God who is able, the God who is able, we are released from our bondage to possessions and are enabled to then respond freely, respond generously to the needs of other people in our local context and beyond. Our chief incentive is always being the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior in the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.